In the name of Jesus, who indeed is crowned king over all, not just the king of the world, but our king, our savior. Last week we heard the Apostle Paul write to his co-worker Timothy, what you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching. Paul makes it very clear that there's a distinct pattern that has been laid down in the Bible of what we should believe, how we should live. You can't veer from that pattern and call it biblical Christianity any more than you can put your hands at your side, jump up and down, and call that the chicken dance. The chicken dance, too, has a distinct pattern, doesn't it? A pattern which I will not demonstrate for you at this time or at any. Sorry, Jacob. Of course, if you want to jump up and down with your hands at your side when the chicken dance music comes on, go for it. You're not going to suffer as a result. You might get some strange looks. But it's not the same as if an engineer would hand you building plans for a new bridge and you say to yourself, I can veer from this pattern. We don't need the support structure here. We don't need that support structure over there. How long will such a bridge last? Who knows? Likewise, when we veer from that biblical teaching about who God is and his relationship with us, we could end up suffering eternally. That's why Paul went on to say to Timothy, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. That's our purpose here together this morning and over the next coming weeks. We're following a sermon series on the Apostles' Creed. Not a statement, I believe, written by Jesus' apostles, but one that summarized the teachings that they held and teachings that they taught. The part of the Apostles' Creed that we want to focus on this morning is the second article, the first part, where we confess, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Just as your cutting board at home bears the most blade marks right in the center of the board because that's where your knife has come down again and again as you cut through carrots and cucumbers. This teaching about Jesus bears the most scars from repeated attacks. Because what you believe about Jesus, who he is and what he did for you, will determine where you spend eternity. And so Satan continues to work hard to shred that teaching about Jesus that he might shred our faith in him. So we'll guard the good deposit. We'll learn today that what we're confessing is Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of Mary who suffered and died for me. Or to put it even another way, Jesus' humiliation when he humbled himself. That means my exaltation. And it's cause for exaltation. Listen to the words of our text as they're recorded in Galatians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul writes, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to Christians living in the province of Galatia. We would call that central Turkey today. We learned about one of these congregations last week. Paul and Barnabas made a stop in the town of Lystra where they had preached about Jesus and where Paul had also healed a man who had been lame from birth. When Paul and Barnabas had returned to their home congregation of Antioch, word reached him that false teachers had infiltrated these new and young congregations. They were teaching that, oh, it's great that you have come to know and believe in Jesus. 
But if you really want to be certain of salvation, then you need to add things to that. You need to do things like refrain from working on the Sabbath, refrain from eating certain kinds of foods. The Apostle Paul correctly pointed out that all those Old Testament ceremonial laws were simply pictures of Jesus. And we New Testament believers are not obligated to continue to follow those ceremonial laws. Paul spent basically six chapters in his letter to the Galatians to say, in Jesus you have the perfect Savior. Why? Because he is fully God and he's fully human. When's the last time you've contemplated this teaching of God's Word? That Jesus is 100% God and yet at the same time, 100% human. It's one of the teachings that's right up there with the doctrine of the Trinity. How can God be three persons, yet one God? This side of heaven will never be able to understand that. And this side of heaven will never be able to understand how Jesus can be fully God and fully human at the same time. Sometimes people think that when we hear the Bible say that Jesus is fully God and fully man, what they mean is that God was acting human. It's kind of like what you might say about your brother. My brother's a monkey. Shasa boys, you ever say that about each other? Hope not. You might say that my brother's a monkey, but really what you mean is my brother's acting like a monkey. Because if you ran DNA tests, it would be clear that your brother is 100% human. That's not what the Bible is saying about Jesus. He was not God who just came down and took on human form and acted human for 33 years. Jesus actually still is 100% human today. When you meet him on Judgment Day, you'll get to determine what color his eyes are, what size shoes he would wear. At the same time, though, he remains 100% God. How can that be? The how of it is unimportant. It's the why. Why does my Savior need to be fully God and fully human? That's what Paul explains. Listen again to these words from our text. But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of son. Jesus was born of a woman, the Virgin Mary. He was born under the law, the Ten Commandments that God expected all of us to keep. Jesus, too, now as a human being, was obligated to keep. And he did that to redeem those under the law, to save us. Perhaps we could illustrate it like this. Imagine a toddler walking down the dock, which is jutting out into a lake, And the toddler just keeps on going. Even when the dock ends, he falls into the water. And because he's a toddler, he doesn't know how to swim. He's not wearing his water wings. What's his family going to do? Is dad going to stand on the edge of the dock and yell, Danny! It's a true story. This happened to me. Danny! Swim like this! Not going to help me. What dad needs to do, what dad did, was jump into the water fully clothed. We had just come from the airport. Passports were in his pockets. They come floating to the surface. And he wrapped his arms around me. If God is going to save us from sin, he has to dive into humanity. He has to have human arms that can wrap around us. But it's not enough. I don't know exactly how my dad brought me to safety, but I imagine a scene like this. Maybe he swam to the dock and lifted me up to someone who was waiting there to haul me to safety. And if the water was where my dad could not stand, what would happen? If you're treading water and trying to hold something above your head, you start to sink and you might even go underneath the waves. That's what the second article of the Apostles' Creed teaches us, what happened to the Son of God who took on human flesh. 
As he lifted us up to the heavenly Father, he himself sank underneath the waves of God's, God's anger at our sins. I was the only one to fall in that lake that day, but if my whole family, my brother, my two sisters had fallen in, my dad would have been really busy saving us. And he would only have been able to do it one at a time. Here's why our Savior needed to also be God. As a human being, he could only really trade places with one person in hell, but because he remained God, he was able to lift humanity, all of us, to our Heavenly Father and pay for all of our sins. Just how far up did Jesus lift us? Paul talks about that too. Jesus redeemed those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. When Jesus lifted you up, it was so that you could be with a heavenly father, not just get a peek into heaven as if you're a tourist checking out a celebrity's mansion. If you pay enough money, you can have a look, but you can't stay there. Jesus lifted us up that we would be part of God's family. If you were to invite my daughters over this afternoon to hang out with you at your house, I hope they would behave. I hope that as you were chatting in the living room, one of them wouldn't suddenly get up, wander into the kitchen, open the fridge, root around, and find a drumstick to start gnawing on, and when asked why, well, I'm hungry. I would hope they would not run upstairs to your bathroom and go through your medicine cabinet because I have a headache and I'm looking for some Tylenol. That's not what house guests should do. But when they return home, they're welcome to do those things because they're family. See, this is what's so awesome about biblical Christianity. It doesn't just say... God is okay with you if you try really hard to behave from now on. And maybe you'll find a spot in his kingdom. It says God himself and the person of his son came down, he became one of us, and he has lifted you up so that you have a home in heaven. Not because you have behaved. It's in spite of your misbehavior. What are we learning together this morning? We're learning that when we say Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of Mary, that He suffered and died for me. And I'm family. Do you feel like you're part of God's family, though? If you're really part of God's family, there shouldn't be any troubles or difficulties right now in life, right? Right? That's what Satan suggests. He says the fact that you suffer, just like the unbeliever out there, means there really is no God. Or if there is a God, he doesn't really care about you. This is why the second article of the Creed is so important. You go back to this truth of Jesus' humiliation. He humbled himself. He left heaven and he came down here for me. Tell me, if you drop something in the toilet, are you going to stick your hand in there to retrieve it? Depends what it is, right? Piece of candy? No. Some lint that fell out of your back pocket? Absolutely not. You're just going to flush that down. A wedding ring? A cell phone? You don't even hesitate. You plunge your hand right in, even if the water isn't quite clean. Why? Because what's down there is valuable. This is what the second article teaches us. Even though we were in the cesspool of sin, God did not hesitate to send His Son who dove down here and rescued us. What does that mean He thinks about you? You must be absolutely valuable. Jesus' humiliation means my exaltation, but it means more than that. 
It also calls for exaltation, for me to praise God. Of course, why wouldn't I not want to praise this God who gave so much to make me part of his family? We know this is what we should show God, this kind of praise, and you're doing that here this morning. We've been singing hymns together. But how does this exaltation show in your life? If someone were to look at your checkbook, if someone were to look at your day timer, would that proclaim, Jesus is my God and Lord? If I were to interview your family, your friends, your coworkers, would they say, yes, Jesus is Lord of that person's life? Often Jesus and what he has done for us becomes an afterthought. Again, this is why the second article is so important. What did Jesus do for me? He left heaven. He became human. He let himself be subject to diaper changes. And to put up with parents who were slow to understand him. And to hang out with disciples who didn't fully grasp his mission. He endured ridicule. He gave up his self-respect, his honor, But when his enemies managed to pin his hands to the cross, they only managed to make what exclamation? God loves you this much. Right? When you go back to the humiliation, we end up saying, how can I not honor this God with my attitudes, with my actions? That's what Paul resolved to do in the final words to his letter to the Galatian Christians He said, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You and I as believers are dead to the world because the world is dead to us. Why? Because we have been exalted all the way up into the heavens. You and I are part of God's family. And the Apostle Paul urges us this morning, don't wait to heaven to make that proclamation. Make it now with your lives, with your actions. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep and guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Amen.